Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, what is selective mutism and how can we help? And I'm in conversation with Gino Hippolito. Right, my name is Gino Hippolito, I'm a speech language therapist. Um, I work for St George's NHS Foundation Trust um, and I specialise in selective mutism. Um, and I've also got a wife and two children um, and living in South London. Could you start off just by telling us what is selective mutism? And is that the right phrase as well? Because I've been questioned on this. Selective. No, it is. Well, um, it, at the moment, that is what it's called um, based on all the diagnostic statistical manuals. Um, so yeah, that is the term. It used to be called elective mutism before, and then it's just changed uh, in 1994 in the DSM um, 4. But um, there is, yeah, so I'll first explain what selective mutism is and then how what some people might propose it should be called okay. so um the way it's um what selective mutism is it is a considered anxiety disorder um and that was a recently just acknowledged in the dsm-5 and um which, the great thing about that is there's been a lot more research now um and a lot more interest in finding out more about selective mutism since that in 2013 but it, it is considered a bit like a, a phobia of speaking or a phobia of being heard. And like with any phobia, when you're um, confronted with a threat, so the threat is, is being heard or where there's an, a situation where there's an expectation to speak. Um, and when you're confronted with that threat, then your response is either you fight, you flight, avoid the situation totally, or you freeze. And so a lot of people will freeze. And in doing so, then they can't get their words out. Um, and so, um, just like with any kind of phobic reaction, if you are aware of the threat, you're hypervigilant, um, you're constantly aware of where that threat might be, um, and, and it's quite exhaustive for the individual with selective mutism. And so when you think about the situation, say in a school situation, there's constant expectation to speak in school. And so the poor child with selective mutism in a school situation is exhausted by the end of the day because there's that constant threat constant hypervigilance. Um, so what some people don't like about the title selective mutism is they feel that it's because um, the individual with selective mutism has um, control over it that they select they specifically select to speak when they want to and when they don't mm -hmm. and, and that's where the misinterpretation comes in uh, and sometimes it can be unhelpful but I think the the idea behind it is that they speak in select situations and don't in others. But a lot more people are saying that actually a better term was maybe called situational mutism, where there are specific situations where the individual with selective mutism is mute. And um, I, whilst I work with paediatrics, I will try and as much as possible say the individual with selective mutism, just because there are adults with selective mutism as well. And for a long time, a lot of people have been talking about children with selective mutism. Um, but actually there are adults with selective mutism as well. And that's really important to acknowledge. So it sounds like that kind of phraseology is a bit like, um, I do a lot of work in self-harm. And if we go back a few years, we used to use the term deliberate self-harm and we've lost the deliberate for kind of similar reasons that it sort of puts the onus on the individual and makes it sound like this is entirely of their, their choosing. So from what you're saying, then selective mutism, it's about the fact that sometimes a child will be able to speak and, and sometimes not. Is that right? That's right. Depending on the situation, uh, might be who is near, um, where the person might be at. Um, again, it's that where there's the, that expectation to speak. Um, and so, and it changes, it, it may seem like it changes all the time, but often there is a pattern to it. Um, however, each, I suppose, profile that a child or individual or young person experiences is different. Um, it's a quite a diverse population where, where some um, may not speak so much at home and it might be the opposite. They might speak outside of the home, um, but more often than not, we find that it's more difficult to speak outside of the home and they're feeling more comfortable when they're speaking to close relatives inside the home. And are the kind of underlying reasons for the mutism often similar or is this a kind of a, a symptom of many different things? Um, I think they tend to be quite similar in a sense there's a predisposition um, like with a lot of anxiety disorders the behavioral inhibition temperament um, and then there's um, often tend to be kind of family history 
Um, so there would be a, some sort of form of genetic predisposition. Then there's also um, the environment um, where um, might um, where there might be a lot of pressure with communication. Um, and so if you're behaviorally inhibited, quite sensitive to things, um, and then all of a sudden you're put in a pressure situation, um, then that can then trigger the selective mutism. Often we find the onset tends to happen between the ages of two and five, which is when a child transitions into nursery or, or school, um, because the communication environments, they're so different. So at home, you know, the child speaks when they want to, uh, it's kind of child led often. And then whereas when you're at school um, or nursery, often it's adult led um, in terms of the adult asks you a question, you then respond when it comes to a learning environment. And also then you're in, it could be quite overwhelming for the child because um, there's other children there who you've got to learn to share with who are snatching your toys. Uh, and then if you're just shocked and overwhelmed by that, um, then that can be then that can be enough to just trigger the anxiety, which then um, tightens their vocal folds, and they find it difficult to then then speak in those situations. And if that's continued time and time again and reinforced, then it then becomes selective mutism. And who is affected, and how prevalent is it? Um, it's it's really difficult to say. A lot of studies, if you look in the literature, you've got clinical studies, you've got studies in the community. Generally. Um, Generally, a ballpark figure is in the under eights population, it's more prevalent, which is understandable. And um, so it's roughly one in 140. Um, and that was from a study by Bergman um, in, I think, 2002. And then with the older children between seven and 12, there was another study done and, and roughly about one in 550. And then there was a um, dissertation um, by um, Sutton, who is actually an adult with selective mutism, who wrote a, a um, a paper um, on um, adults with selective mutism, and he um, suggested that there's roughly maybe one in 2,400 in terms of prevalence for adults with selective mutism. Wow, and do we see lots of comorbidity with other conditions? So would we diagnose selective mutism in some young people who are non-verbal autistic, for example, or is that a different thing? Um, when it comes to non-verbal autistic then you wouldn't call that selective mutism but certainly there is comorbidity with um selective mutism in autism and i think the dsm-5 can be quite confusing there because it, mm. if you read the dsm-5 it may seem like you can't have selective mutism in autism at the same time but actually you actually can um, particularly what, the main thing is you need to establish that the person can actually speak in other situations so they have to be verbal before they're given a, a diagnosis of selective mutism. But common um, coexisting conditions um, is um, communication difficulties, so ranging between 10 to 50%, depending on the studies. Um, and then also anxiety disorder, comorbid anxiety disorder, and social anxiety disorder, social um, specific phobias and um, separation anxiety um, are often the, the high prevalent anxiety conditions. And are there things that we should be kind of looking out for? Is this a kind of instance where if we can pick up sort of early warning signs, for example, that we're able to do work around prevention or not? Absolutely. No, definitely. Um, we know that the onset for a lot of children with selective mutism tends to be the ages of two and five um, and can easily be picked up in, say, nursery and school. Um, What's really challenging is just our view of communication and that often and also view of children and behavior within school that if they're quiet, then they're not kicking up a fuss. Therefore, we don't really need to sound the alarm bells here. But some, it's often those children that might have other behavioral difficulties and communication difficulties that they might then be referred. But actually a silent child, a quiet child um, is actually someone that a uh, someone in nursery or school needs to just keep an eye on. And so when it comes to selective mutism for a diagnosis, they need to um, have a clear pattern where they speak in some situations and do not in others. Um, and also this pattern continues for more than a month. And um, if it's first month in school, then add another month, so the first two months of school. Uh, because it's quite common for children to be quiet and silent in that first month because right? it's such a big change but we would then expect children to start to vocalize start to interact more but if children continue to be silent that's when i suggest after that 
um, one month period or if they've just started the school after the two month period refer on to whichever agency takes the lead in selective mutism whether it's the speech and language therapist the educational psychologist the local authority another thing too there's high prevalence in um, the bilingual multilingual population um, four times more likely to have selective mutism and in another study they so the red flags would be if the child was um, bilingual, multilingual, but also had a, an anxious predisposition, they were more likely to develop selective mutism. Um, so um, a lot of uh, practitioners might be confused because of the silent period, but this is where I'd suggest if the child has an anxious predisposition to maybe then um, investigate further, um, ask the parents whether um, is the child speaking to them when they're outside of the home, um, or do they stop and be quiet when there are people nearby? Um, or do they are they quiet in front of other relatives? So those kind of that kind of information can be really important because a bilingual child will be speaking their own language to their parent in different environments. Are there any other groups that we might see sort of interesting things in terms of communication? I'm wondering about um, like twins, for example, because I know that I've got two daughters the same age um, and they did that what turned out to be quite a typical twin thing of not speaking to anyone except each other with their own kind of language for quite a long time and then developed completely normally and I, I just wondered if there's you know sort of anything with those kinds of examples there um there are examples in the literature but also in um our caseload um in ones of where um maybe one of the twins might have selective mutism um in terms of the prevalence i don't know the exact prevalence of that but it is yeah it makes sense because um i've often heard anecdotally that yes they do um, have their own language to communicate or sometimes rely on the other one who might be a bit more confident perhaps yeah. um, verbally. And are there times when we don't need to worry so sometimes you know someone might be listening to this and then they're suddenly thinking about a particular child in their care I mean are, are there times when we might kind of have a false alarm or is there any kind of thing we can look to in terms of reassurance? Um, one thing to look for reassurance is if the child is starting to feel more comfortable in the environment and then starting to um, be more verbal in that situation. Um, however, if they plateau, um, or what's really important as well as um, another thing gets missed is with selective mutism, you might have high profile selective mutism where it's really clear cut that the child or young person or individual does not speak in specific situations like school. However, there's low profile selective mutism where um, they may speak or respond when they absolutely must, um, say maybe in a class situation where the teacher is giving pressure, um, and they might respond maybe in a one word answer, but they never initiate. And those children are the ones that are really high risk of just continuing on through the school years. Um, and they often then develop other comorbid anxiety disorders as well. Um, so I think I would rather err on the side of caution. Um, and refer on and then you could always say no nothing to worry about or maybe we'll keep an eye on that kind of thing but i as a practitioner i'd encourage people if they're not talking consistently if you're not seeing improvement if they're plateauing then at least speak to another professional about that um, or make a referral so just keeping it real a moment because we all know how hard it is to get through referral processes what should you know if a, a, a parent or carer a member of staff at school is concerned about a child what does that referral need to look like what are the things that you're expecting to learn from us so that you know whether or not this is a case you need to take on okay if the, the child is is not speaking um, to either adults or peers um, within the that setting um, this is from the point of view of, of school um, and if um, usually for a diagnosis it, it would have to impact social communication and also education but I would say if one of those things are happening that will eventually affect education or that will eventually affect social communication so I'd say just refer if I see that pattern and it continues for more than a month then I'd say refer and I as a practitioner would want to accept that as a referral now at the same time I can't say that for all services because different services have different criteria um, but I think we I think there is a need to um, to identify this a lot earlier for a lot of children because I'm just speaking to a lot of parents um, who have gone through a lot um, and a lot of um, individuals um, teenagers adults who have gone through it and it wasn't picked up earlier on um, they're in such a study, only a really small percentage got diagnosed in childhood. So um, if anything, I as a professional would rather err on caution 
Um, but what is tricky, like you said, there are, there are gaps in service and service delivery, and that's really important. And even within our profession, and just to encourage those in edu educational psychology um, or those working in local authority, that there needs to be a service for children with selective mutism in every local authority or every NHS area. But some profession has to take um, the lead for that. And that's the tricky thing is because sometimes maybe speech therapists might say it's not our remit, even though Royal College of Speech Language Therapists say it is um, our remit to at least be involved in children with, um, and young people with selective mutism. But um, then other situations, the educational psychologists might say it's not our remit, or sometimes CAMS might even say it's not our remit. So it's really important that wherever you are in your local situation, that there needs to be conversation with professionals to work out who's going to take charge, because there are a lot of gaps right now across the UK in terms of provision for SM. And how can we help? Like, should the adults who are supporting a child, are there things that they should be doing before they even seek that help? Or, you know, what, what can we do that might help? And, and, and really importantly, what might we do that might make things worse inadvertently? Yeah, I mean, things that will, I'll start with the things that make things worse, because at least that can be something we can realize, okay, we're just going to stop doing that. First of all, putting pressure um, on the child to communicate, um, that's going to make it worse. Um, also making comments about the child that they don't speak or they can't speak those kind of things will affect the child's confidence in speaking and start they'll start perceiving themselves as okay this is just who i am i just can't speak i can't do this anymore um also when um maybe take when adults take it personally i think adults can easily take it personally um whether it's a teacher or maybe a relative um, if the child's not speaking to you, you sometimes may feel that, okay, they're rude or maybe um, they've got something against you. Um, what's really important by understanding that it's anxiety disorder, it's not, it's not because of you and, and to, if anything, get over yourself <laughs> and focus on the child because um, once we take things personally like that, then it will react, uh, it will impact our interactions um, with the child uh, and we will have whether we are aware of it or not, um, convey negativity to the child. And that's not gonna help at all. If anything, um, what I would suggest is first of all, take the pressure off speaking um, of, or that pressure for that child to speak. And if anything, create opportunities for the child to communicate and participate like with all the other children. I think if anything, that's the first step to, to, to help the child uh, enjoy themselves in that environment. So we're going to enable them to participate, but without vocally participating. Yeah, it doesn't have to be vocally. Um, they don't have to participate vocally. So what I'd suggest is, first of all, maybe even before considering speaking, think of, is the child actually focused in the activity? Are they attending to the activity? Because they might be just totally um, just in, in freeze mode and, and not even engaging with the actual activity. So then they, the practitioner needs to think, okay, what can I do to make it easier for them to actually just engage and attend to the activity? And if they are attending to the activity, are they, are they actually participating in the activity? Are they doing something like a, are the other children are? And it can be just non-verbally too. And then maybe the next step, are they interacting in the activity, even if it's non-verbally? because that's what you want them to do is actually participate and interact. And it doesn't have to be verbally um, at this stage. And then by little by little through small steps um, and building rapport on a one-to-one -one situation and then little by little um, allowing that to happen in the, in the learning environment, then the child will then be able to start saying maybe one word um, and then maybe a few words and then maybe eventually sentences within that educational setting. But it happens, it can speed up a lot quicker when the younger they are. So in nursery age, we find it that the process can be a lot quicker there. After we find after year one, it can be, it take longer for them to move up those stages of confidence speaking. Is that because it's kind of become such a habit or their anxiety has got really high or do we know why? It's I think, yeah, both. I think it's, it's just been ingrained. Um, when I look at those um, two longitudinal studies and um, done in the 2000s, and what's interesting that their age of referral is roughly eight and a half, and they accessed um, a, um, a psychology service, and um, they tracked them into adulthood, and they found that roughly, um, I think I wrote this down somewhere, um, about 42 to 61 percent still had SM in adulthood um, because they had SM for five years before they were referred. 
Um, now, this is not doom and gloom for, for those who are late referrals, but if anything, there is an emphasis where when children are referred early, I was um, involved in a, a team in, in South in Kent um, where we did an audit of children who were referred in, um, in nursery um, and reception, and we tracked them. We, um, we, all we did was we offered training for, uh, for parents and also teachers, and then we set up a meeting where we talked about um, things you can do to change the environment, make it easy for the child to speak. And we just tracked these children, and by the age of, by the end of year, or by the end of reception, so by the age of six, 86% um, of the children had resolved without any other kind of work. Um, so just light touch, but earlier on can be really effective. Whereas, you know, once they're in year one or two or onwards or in teenage years, then, I mean, once you're in teenage years, you, you're dealing with likely to have comorbid conditions. Um, but certainly in the early primary school years, you do find it can take several years to then resolve after that. Are there any kind of universal sort of strategies that we can, you know, use within an education setting in particular that would make it less likely for like all children to develop these kinds of issues? So that taking that approach that sometimes when we look to help uh, individuals, we can end up kind of helping everyone. And yeah, like. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like There's a thing which as speech therapists, we um, one of our bread and butter strategies or, or um, forms of intervention is um, parent-child interaction therapy or adult-child interaction therapy where when you're interacting and we do this with children with who have a stammer or who might have language difficulties to help develop the language but what it does it actually takes the pressure off communication but in doing so it actually helps develop communication so an example of that is try not to ask too many questions um, and just make comments um, so if you're dealing with children in, say, earlier on in nursery or reception, um, play with them, build rapport, do something that's fun. Um, so they're interested, they're more likely to engage and try not to ask too many questions. Just comment on it, almost like a commentary thing. And also pause to allow time for the child to respond as well. Um, but with selective mutism, there's a slight difference the way I'd work with a child with language difficulties and a child with selective mutism in that situation. So a child with language difficulties, I would um, encourage the adult to be face to face um, with the child so that they can see all the, the visual cues of talking and speaking, things like that. But with a child with selective mutism, eye contact can be uh, very confronting and quite overwhelming. So what I suggest is actually with the adults be side by side or alongside when you're playing with the child. So the, you're not making that, you know, um, eye contact, they're taking that pressure off, you're making comments um, and you're doing something fun, the child is more likely to make comments, feel more relaxed um, and then start speaking in that situation. And then little by little, you can then step it up into more of a educational um, activity. Um, but that's what we call um, the research calls that defocus communication. Um, and that's something which any one could do and any nursery staff or reception practitioner can do and it's great for all children to develop their language skills it's great for children who stammer as well because you're pausing giving them time to um to interact and respond and you're doing something fun when you're having fun it's it's hard to be anxious it's hard to to um be tense um, but if you're having fun you start to relax and you're more likely to speak and I guess that really helps with building that kind of that trust and that relationship as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and that feeling of the sense of acceptance of the child. Um, that there's a common theme there um, when reading adults' um, um, experience of selective mutism. And even actually um, when I saw um, there was an adult with selective mutism who spoke actually at the Royal College of Speech Therapists um, uh, there's a, a seminar with a clinical excellence network and she spoke about her experience of having selective mutism um, and she answered some questions as well um, which is quite confronting or a, a room full of speech therapists and you're an adult with selective mutism um, and she said that was the first time um, and she tweeted this was the first time she spoke in, in 12 years in front of an audience in public um, but what she said was, um, actually, I wrote these things down because they're really important. She said she felt um, accepted, included, and not pressured. And that lowered her anxiety, which made it easier for her to speak. Mm. And I noticed that your interview with Caroline um, a few weeks ago, too, there was the same kind of theme of just acceptance um, of the person for who they are um, and just enjoying that time with them. Um, that takes the pressure down, um, pressure off. 
Um, so there, yeah, there's those common themes, absolutely, those interpersonal themes. It feels like a, a bit like the advice here to adults, whether they're working with or um, living with a child, that it's almost that we should just try and relax a bit and, and yeah. have fun and almost try and forget about this difficult thing and just try and get on with the day to day of enjoying a child and, and hoping to create a bit of a bond there. Absolutely. And that's why a lot of people, um, when it comes to speech therapists working with young children, it seems like all we do is play. <laughs> um, and my, my children ask me, well, what, what do you do, Dad? And I say, oh, well, I, I do a lot of play with children. I talk about the different toys I play. And they say, oh, I want to go to your work. But th that's it. That's essentially it, is looking for, particularly for the young children, looking for things that's fun with the child um, and using just ways where there's no pressure to speak or communicate, but having fun. This often then gives the child motivation to want to speak and share and interact because children with selective mutism, they do want to speak. Um, and when they're in a situation where they feel comfortable, they will speak and you will probably talk to their parents or siblings that they can talk forever. <laughs> Often when they come home as well, they're just very chatty perhaps because they have been silent for the whole day. Um, so they do want to speak. It's just giving them an opportunity um, to do that. Um, and should we use like other methods of communication or does that kind of impound the, the mutism? Like, should we allow them to, to write or draw or something to, to show us what they mean if they find it difficult to talk or is that not a good idea? No, absolutely. I think that's great because what we want to, um, send, the message we want to send across here is communication is important, any form of communication. Um, now, when it's, a young child um, or younger child, um, I, similar to the, what I was mentioning before about is the child attending, is the child participating, is the child interacting non-verbally, then you move up. So any form, so um, writing or using gestures, things like that is a non-verbal form of communication, but still interaction. And we want to encourage that. With the younger children, we do want them to um, have the opportunity to speak. Um, likewise with, with um, young people as well. Um, but the more you move, get older with SM, then it's also important to just consider that sometimes these difficulties may not necessarily go away. Um, and actually we've got to think about um, maybe how to, um, how to cope with um, having SM. Um, and, and not only that, but also as a society, how are we going to respond? Um, because it's impacting their access to things, it's impacting their access to jobs, it's impacting their access to just doing things like other adults are doing. Um, you know, catching a train, it can be very difficult to asking for a ticket or whatever it might be. There's, so um, when it comes to adults with SM, um, I'm probably not the best to be able to convey it. In fact, I can't art articulate it as well as those adults with SM. Um, so what I would do is signpost you to ispeak.org. Um, it's a website developed by um, adults with SM, um, and they talk a lot about the social dis disability model uh, and about just how um, there's things that society can do to make it easier um, to, for them to be included, for them to be accepted, and for them to have access to things like everyone else. Because when we think about it, we live in a very verbal-centric society, um, and in a subtle way, um, that not many people are aware of where um, a lot of um, well, adults with SM um, are experiencing prejudice. They're, um, they're not having access to things like everyone else. So from a social disability model, we as society need to take responsibility and make some changes as well. Now, I don't have all the answers to all those things, but there, at least there's a conversation that can be started. Absolutely. And presumably when you are supporting a child with selective mutism, you're also supporting probably quite a worried and maybe frustrated family. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, yep. I mean, with any child with, in that situation, I think a parent will be very worried and concerned. I, I know I would be. But also alongside that, often um, children with SM, um, often there's family members who might have anxiety disorders as well, comorbid conditions. Um, and often would find in case history that maybe one of the parents might also um, have anxiety. And so there is that element there. And, and um, occasionally I would have to talk to parents and just say, what's really important is to be aware of our own 
um, anxiety and how we might project that to our child. Um, and also, when I talk about the child taking risks, I encourage parents and the children to take risks and, and for the parents to model that as well. So it's what we call a have a go attitude. So, and it doesn't have to be in relation to speaking. It could be anything, it could be like a physical challenge. It could be a vocational challenge or academic challenge. But the idea is to take a risk because of the behavioral inhibition, they're reluctant to take risks. They're, children and young people just or people with SM tend to be risk averse. So um, what we encourage is the parents and the child, but particularly the parents to model taking risks um, and also talking through the child about that and how they felt and how they overcame that because then it just sets up a great model of, for the child to, to do that. Um, and often a lot of parents will have lots of experiences where they'll have to, they will literally feel that they are taking a risk. Um, maybe in a social situation, or it could even just be talking to the bus driver or talking to the shop assistant, that could feel like of taking a risk. Sounds scary, actually. The idea is a parent being told, right, you need to do this and role model it for your child. And yeah. presumably there we're looking at kind of supporting and scaffolding to try and make sure that the risk is taken, but the outcome is not negative. Yes, that's right. Um, so um, there's also ways in um, what we might encourage the parent, um, there's a strategy which Maggie Johnson and Alison Winters came up with, it's called the wait, wait technique. And the idea is say, when the parent and his child is maybe at the shop, um, and obviously the parents talk to the child that this is what's going to happen, that if the shop assistant, or maybe if they're in public, if someone asks the child a question, um, often it might be, oh, what's your name? Uh, or how old are you? Um, that's often the questions that shop assistants or sometimes strangers might, might say. So we'd encourage parents to wait five seconds. Again, it's then creating an opportunity for the child to respond. If the child doesn't respond, then the parent might turn to the child and then um, turn, decrease the communication risk by turning into a, a choice question. So saying, oh, so are you um, seven or are you nine? So then the, the child and the child is then looking at the parent. So then it takes the pressure off. They're not looking at the shop assistant. So you've got proximity change there. So all these, by doing these little strategies, it takes the pressure off or, or decreases the pressure anyway for the child. Um, and then the parent waits again for another five seconds. And in those situations, some children might then say something and then the parent can model it back or, or repeat it. Um, but, and then if the child doesn't respond in that situation, then the parent will say, oh, you're nine, aren't you? And then move on. But the idea in that situation, you're actually creating two opportunities for the child to communicate. Um, and so you're not avoiding, but you're also, like you said, scaffolding to make it easier. And if a child was able to speak in that situation and that was kind of unusual, should we be kind of celebrating and praising that? Or do we just kind of quietly move on and maybe acknowledge it later? Yeah, I wouldn't um, make it too much of a hoo-ha. Um, <laughs> Um, it's interesting because in, say, the States, they often talk about praise um, and um, but maybe it might be culture specific because I know in, in the States, they're very big on on making things big. Um, <laughs> but in the UK, we're a bit more reserved. Um, so um, so I, what's, we've had conversations about this, uh, um, those who work in SM, like about the difference in cultures and then how our approach is to intervention. What we would say in the UK is just um, acknowledge it, but not make it a big deal. Um, because sometimes if you make it a big deal, it then um, puts the spotlight on the child. And sometimes in that situation, that's the last thing, actually a lot of the times, that's the last thing the child wants. So if you move that into a classroom situation, if a teacher said, oh, well done for talking, great job, then that's the last thing the child would want because everyone's then looking at the child, spotlights on the child, and they're thinking, I never want to do this again. So. <laughs> Just acknowledge it and then move on. Um, but then they can maybe have just a word, say, hey, that was a great job, well done for you know, being brave and, and saying those things, you know, maybe on a one-to-one -one situation. And would you maybe be communicating that with home as well so parents can acknowledge it with their child and feel maybe reassured or? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, I'd say use the same kind of strategies at home and also in school too. 
And what's the role of um, support staff? Because I do loads of work with support staff, kind of our school nurses, our learning support assistants, all those different staff who um, are often alongside our kids and, and often will have a really important role with any child who's struggling for, for whatever reason. And I, I would assume, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe a child might build like a really good relationship with maybe one member of support staff who might be able to really help with this. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, particularly with the younger children, um, I find that the support we work through the support staff. Um, in fact, there's with younger children, there are a lot of children who have never met me before as a therapist. And I worked purely through the parent and, um, and the teachers because they're the ones who are with the child day in, day out. They're the ones who are most important to the child. If the child never speaks to me ever again, then there's no no problem with that from their side of things. Um, and there are situations where I've actually never met the child um, in terms of um, uh, we, we've had assessment, but in terms of in the school setting and things like that, because I've purely just been meetings with the parent and the teaching or teaching staff. And if anything, they're the most important um, uh, people involved when it comes to supporting children with selective mutism, because they're with them day in, day out. And so we involve them. If they're younger, we just give them these strategies earlier on in nursery or reception. Once we move into year one onwards, we tend to then have a more formal structured small steps program. So we might do shaping or sliding in and that support staff will be really key um, in that. Because What's then once that, sliding in? Sliding in is um, stimulus fading or it's a, a strategy technique where you expose the child to, um, to the anxious situation. So um, of an adult, being near them or approaching closer to them while they're talking um, and the idea is um, so for an example the child might be with a parent or someone who they feel comfortable with speaking to um, so they might be in a room playing a game or activity or maybe they might be um, counting or, or um, doing some sort of activity which is fun and, and light-hearted um, and then the new adult who that you want to introduce into the child's talking circle will then move closer and closer they might be outside of the room eventually once the child is continuing talking feeling comfortable they maybe open the door and then maybe the next step might be then moving in just outside um, inside the door eventually maybe moving in closer to the table eventually then sitting at the table eventually maybe then um, participating in the activity and eventually maybe asking a question or or talking in that activity so it's a really small steps approach of moving that new person involved and eventually that person becomes a new talking partner and when that person becomes a new talking partner then the, um, often the, the parent often then moves out and is faded out. And then from that point onwards, that new talking partner helps slide in other children and other um, support staff um, in the school. So that's sliding in. Shaping is a similar, well, shaping is when maybe the parent or comfortable um, communication partner is not involved for some reason or, or other. Um, and so what the, um, the, adult who um, is doing the shaping work um, who might be maybe a speech therapist to start with or it could be if um, it's if the speech therapist is training um, the practitioner um, the educational practitioner then the idea would be in really small step approach moving from non-verbal communication to maybe eventually sounds it could be maybe with instruments and then sounds and blowing with um, a, like a recorder or a kazoo to eventually making sounds with the mouth to eventually making syllables to eventually words then phrases then sentences so small step approach um, to communi verbal communication and then once that's established in terms of from a conversational point of view then similar to sliding in then you can then slide in other children or other um, adults within the school setting and how long does this kind of process take like how long would a, a child normally be going through this kind of, sort of therapeutic approach it, it really depends again depends on um, how collaborative the work has been if everyone is on board um, and we recommend at least if they're doing this approach do at least three times a week mm -hmm. um, so it can be challenging sometimes um, when it comes to working it out in the school day um, and also finding rooms available as well. So it's hard to say hard and fast because some children, they may move up really quickly. Others, it does take some time, but you would expect um, at least pro we would expect some progress after several sessions. I'm not saying they're gonna be speaking freely, but at least there's progress in terms of allowing 
the, the person to be um, in the room with the child hearing their voice. However, if the selective mutism is really ingrained, what's really important is to break the step down into really small steps. Um, that's where you might need a, a speech therapist or educational psychologist involved to problem solve and work out what that small step might look like. And do you ever get issues where like if there's a long holiday or say the period of lockdown where a child might revert to previous behaviours having kind of overcome it once? Absolutely yeah no um, uh, that often happens um, and I often reassure parents and teachers that this might happen um, but often I find that children bounce back quicker uh, and that's a good sign when they do that because at some point in time there's going to be a transition they're going to transition to another year group or a different teacher as well and so it almost starts again um, so I might almost um, yeah I talk to parents and teachers to expect this to happen um, and to kind of normalize it but what we do want to see is uh, is the child to then also improve um, probably at a slightly quicker rate than it was before so do you often see that there's a step back when a child like transitions into a new class or like between primary and secondary? That's presumably quite tricky. Yeah, it's a big transition, that one. I mean, it's interesting because, again, like each child is different. Some children surprise me and they might come into the new year group or maybe even go into secondary because no one else knows them and say, OK, I, I feel comfortable because no one knows that I don't talk, but I, I can talk now. So they they then start talking in secondary. Um, that might happen also in, in, um, in transition. But more often than not, we do find there is a bit of a setback. Um, but as long as there's things in place to support that transition, um, often that setback um, is, is shortened. So things that we would suggest is uh, maybe um, a transition book. Um, if it's Moving across year groups, then um, the child to build rapport with the new teacher. So we encourage schools to find out. I know some schools don't release the new teacher or find uh, the teachers don't even know who what they're teaching, you know, until the end of term three. But what we encourage schools to do is to identify that for the sake of this child um, and then um, identify who that new teacher is and then look for in that last term in term three to start building rapport with that teacher so maybe sending the child to, um, to that teacher to deliver errands or something like that or sometimes some schools they might have the new teacher go into that classroom and teach um, some subjects or so towards the end of year three so that they build that rapport um, some teachers are great they might send a message over the holidays and looking forward to seeing you um, also a transition book can be really helpful in just um, maybe taking photos of the new classroom um, maybe um, the new environment or where the toilets are going to be, where you know the, the food hall is going to be, if particularly if things have changed, um, so that the child just leading up to that new year can then look at those things and just to be aware, okay, that's where I need to put things or that's where I need to do things because they, what they don't like is that change and not knowing. Um, I had worked with a child once and she um, found it, she really struggled um, in her transition from reception to year one because she didn't know where to put her coat. Um, she was anxious about, she didn't know where she's going to put her coat on the coat peg. So little things like even taking a photo, this is where you put your bag when you come in, this is, you get your name tag when you come in, you put your name on the board, whatever the procedure is, but so that the child will know what's happening. Uh, and that can at least bring down the anxiety to make it easier. And if a teacher knows that they've got coming into their class, a child who's got history of selective mutism, whether it's current or kind of previous, are there any specific things you think that they as the, as the class teacher or sort of designated support staff should specifically be doing for that child and for their family? Yeah, I mean, what would be amazing, this would be in an ideal world, is if the teacher or the support staff can do a home visit before that new year. I know that's not always possible with schools, uh, but when I've seen that happen, um, when schools have allowed the teacher to do that or the teaching system to do that, um, it's made such a difference. Um, and sometimes that can really help build that rapport earlier on and make it easier for the child in their transition in. Um, one thing that's gonna be really important, we'll be talking to the parents, to find out, okay, what was helpful, what wasn't, um, what does the child like? So they can have it in the back of their mind, things that the child enjoys, so that you know, if the child is feeling anxious, um, that they can then think of the activities the child can do so to bring that anxiety down. Um, and also you yeah, ask the parents what, what helps in different situations for the child. So communication is really, really important. It's really important between home and school. It's so important. I find that when there's the lack of that communication, often there's 
um, the progress is slower. And could or, the, sorry, go on. Uh, or, or I also, another point is if maybe one of the two um, are not on board, then often we find the, community, the progress is being slower. Okay, so we kind of want to do that kind of genuine sort of child-centred team around the child kind of yeah. approach. And um, just thinking about the, the home visit um, suggestion, which, yeah, sounds like a, a, a wonderful thing to do, but not always possible. Do you think that like doing it like this over Zoom, is that something that would be helpful or not so much? You know what, that's really interesting. That's because I wouldn't have thought of that until COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting it's not the case for all children, but some children um, actually find this type of um, interaction easier because there's a proximity there, because you're just on a screen. You're not there in person, you're there on the screen. Um, however, at the same time, there are some children who do find it difficult. Another thing I also notice is that the younger children, they're so exposed to social media and the parents using this that actually it's, they're kind of desensitized to it, so it's easy for them to communicate and interact. Um, ha at the same time, some do find it difficult. Um, in the last few months when I've worked with a child with selective mutism and their parent, what we tend to do is I interact with the parent, we do some games or playing with these younger children. Um, we play with some of the toys and little by little the child then might be outside of the screen, but little by little as they relax and become more comfortable, see that this is fun, they start become, coming into the screen. And then with this particular child I worked with, eventually she was then interacting, asking me questions um, or making comments about what I was doing in play. So some, you can use a kind of graded approach again also in that kind of interaction. Okay. It must be so great when you have a child who's been mute who then does choose to interact with you. That must feel brilliant. It is amazing. I, I don't want to um, have that, to, uh, I don't want to chase that and that being the, the thing I would chase for as a therapist, even though it is such a rewarding thing. But I'm knowing that some, I know sometimes when that becomes the goal in my mind, it can be, as a therapist anyway, it can be frustrating. And I don't want that frustration because sometimes that's my expectation. But yes, absolutely, it's really rewarding. Yeah. And can you tell me a bit about your research? So you're doing some um, NIHR. Uh, yes. So so that's right. Um, recently, Maggie Johnson and I, we wrote a chapter about um, selective mutism and pragmatic language impairment. And there's um, some papers have suggested that maybe children with selective mutism may have an underlying pragmatic language impairment. Um, in this chapter that we wrote, we suggest that it's not the case for most children with SM. However, so, pragmatic. so pragmatic language impairment, it's, it's kind of like um, um, ASD, um, but it's without the it's more of the difficulties with the pragmatic so the social use of language okay. um rather than um aspects of rigidity um and um so there is difficulty with social communication but it's more from the pragmatic language side of things okay. um so what we're suggesting is that is not the case for the majority of children with sm uh, but however like with any child they might have pragmatic language difficulties um, and if you um, if we did have a child like that this is how we would assess the child or this is how we would provide intervention um, that's one of the things that we did on the um, during the fellowship but also I've been working on a systematic review as well looking at um, non-pharmacological interventions um, and what's interesting there's been a lot more research since the change um, in terminology in DSM-5 I mean, it becoming anxiety disorders, there's been several RCTs, so um, just writing up that paper at the moment um, and planning to do a meta-analysis there with some of the RCTs. Um, so that's something in the pipeline. Um, what's really interesting trend is that those, um, the interventions that I've noticed are, are effective, there is that rapport building, there is the changing the environment or systems approach in a way, but also there's always a behavioral element there as well. Mm. That's, did that surprise you or did it change? Um, it was actually, there, there was um, a lot of people were talking about that already. Um, and it, actually a lot of studies were using that, but never really talking too much about it. Um, so there was, yeah, that it's something which we noticed. What was interesting, there was a, um, you, using CBT, but with an online web application. But in this particular study, it was just the clinician and the child so there wasn't any teacher involved. There wasn't a parent involved. The parent had a bit of homework, but that was it. And what was interesting, the child didn't make 
much progress. And if anything, the active control made slightly better progress. Oh. Um, but the active control was playing computer games. Um, now, what I might <laughs> hypothesize about that is that actually with computer games, there's no pressure to communicate, but you're also building rapport as well. Mm. Um, but um, with this situation, I, I see that there is such an important role for parents and teachers to be involved. And if it's just a clinician and the child, there's only so far you can go um, in terms of generalizing um, the communication, the speech and other situations. You really do need other people on board to help that generalization, to support that young child or individual in communicating other situations. Yeah, which is, is great to hear. Um, and you've given us some really good and, and practical ideas about things that, that people can do to help. Um, I wondered if you would mind kind of closing with, I always cr kind of create these instant insights of the, you know, the minute, if you only listen to one minute, this is the one of, of maybe some, um, just a, a very brief overview of the, the things we can helpfully do if we're, if we're worried about a child. Um, early identification um, and access to services is really important for clinicians, parents, teachers, um, and we all have a role to play. Um, what's really important, address it and acknowledge the speech anxiety with the child so that they know that you know, um, and also that they know that, that what you wanna do is create opportunities to communicate, participate, and have fun, and you wanna take the pressure off speaking. Um, and also whatever you do, um, small steps is really important. Um, do things in small steps and it doesn't have to be just in speaking, uh, but also with any kind of goal that or thing that the child wants to achieve, try and do things in small steps to take that pressure off. Um, and also collaboration is so important. Parents, teachers, clinicians, all working together. And also if the greater society can also make some changes as well to uh, allow for access for adults with SM, that would be great. Yeah.